She's the winner of the AHA's 2018 Eugene Asher Distinguished Teaching Award. She's also a former member of the Digital Public Library of America's Educational Advisory Board. Kate's historical research um, is examining the early 19th century experience of pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing in upper Midwestern Ojibwe and missionary cultures. And that grows out of her previous book, Making Marriage, Husbands, Wives, and the American State in Dakota and Ojibwe Country. Um, Kate is currently at work on a new book, which many of her Twitter friends are very excited about, me among them, A Pedagogy of Kindness. And if you haven't had a chance to read Kate's wonderful uh, post about this, please do. I'll, try, I'll put it in the chat, put the link in the chat in a moment. But that book is under contract with West Virginia University Press, which has really been a leading press for thinking creatively about pedagogy. Um, and I know it's gonna be terrific. So I'm going to do what we all want me to do, which is to stop talking and just turn things over to Kate here. Unmuting my microphone is a good start. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you. So nice to see so many familiar faces and names and a lot of you whom I only know by name, um, but it's lovely to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get us started here. So Whoops, sorry. Okay, so we're here today to talk about creating some breathing room for ourselves in spring semester um, for ourselves and for our students. So first, I wanna make sure we're all comfortable with Zoom. Many of you are going to be experts at Zoom after the couple of semesters that we've had, but I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So your, mucus, your mic is muted right now, um, but you can turn your video on and off using the control that's at the bottom left of your screen. Um, please feel free to have your camera on or off as suits you and that is comfortable for you. You can click on the participation uh, participants tab and see who else is here. And in the chat, you can ask a question or make a comment and Karen will be looking out for those questions and comments as I present. And then you can find emoji reactions over on the right hand side. Um, and so if you wanna give a thumbs up or an applause or anything else that's available to you through the emojis, please do. I wanna say thank you to my teachers before I start. So I wanna give grateful thanks to Karen Costa, Clay Mahoney, Melissa Whaler, Judith Duttle, and all the participants in this summer's Camp Cool, which was offered by the Online Learning Toolkit. And thanks also to my students, especially the students in History 167 and 285 at Knox this fall. So we're gonna talk about five things today. There are three things that I call the little breaths and two things that I call the big breaths. So the little breaths are things that you can do at the beginning of your semester that will generate community and a lot of goodwill and really help you out as the semester progresses. The big breaths are some larger changes you can make to the way that you approach your teaching that can really make that breathing room available. So first, we're gonna talk about teaching your students how to succeed in your particular class. Second, we're gonna talk about how if you're teaching hybrid or high flex or online, you can largely ditch the class schedule. And the third thing is we're gonna talk about how you build community where you're not used to building community perhaps, especially in an online environment. Then we're gonna talk about doing lots of formative assessment next semester. And the final thing we're gonna talk about is letting things go. I want to say before we start that we come from a really wide range of institutions. We are teaching in different modalities. We have different levels of uh, experience. So our teaching situations differ. So what I'm saying may not be directly applicable to your situation. It may need scaling up or scaling down. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat and to think of adaptations as we go that we can share at the end of the presentation. So one. Teaching your students how to succeed in your class. Now, we don't often think that we have a job to teach people to succeed, except in this one area that's become very, very common in our classrooms, which is to think especially about first generation students. There are lots of other groups of students who need a little extra help when they get to college, 
I am a first generation student. And when I went to college, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to do college. I didn't know that I could go visit my professors. I didn't know what office hours were for. I didn't know what the various student services were that were available to me on campus. And things would have been a lot easier for me if I had known. So we're used to thinking about teaching first generation students how to do college. And what I wanna suggest is that we have to teach our students now how to do the modality that we are now teaching in. So that's gonna mean different things for different people. It's gonna mean, sorry, somebody entered and it messed things up, there we go. Um, online, hybrid and high flex. And some of us are still teaching face-to-face -face or in a brick and mortar environment. So you have to teach your students how to engage with your class. Remember that your students are taking multiple classes at once in most cases. They are using multiple pieces of tech depending on what those classes are. And at some campuses like my own, there may even be multiple learning management systems at play. That means they need really clear direction from us about how to engage with the things that we've chosen. So in your learning management software or your LMS, make sure that you have a module that says start here. That's the easiest way to cue your students that these are the most important things they should think about as they come into your class. So you will see the first thing in my start here module is my syllabus, but that's not necessarily the most important thing there. I take the time to explain the tech that I'm going to use. Now, this is a Google document, a link to a Google document that says everything in text form, but you'll see that I've also uh, engaged my students in different modalities. And so here I made a video showing them how to use Google Classroom, my LMS, if they weren't used to it before. You can see that I also have visual guides to certain tech and other videos as well. A really key piece of setting off to a really great semester is introducing yourself. We're used to doing that on the first day of class in a brick and mortar environment, but it's just as important when you're online or hybrid or high flex. So take the time to make a little video, record some audio, to write something up, whatever modality works best for you but take the time to close that gap between who they imagine you are as your professor and who you actually are. So my introduction is a short five minute video. It tells them a little bit about my background, something about my politics and my, uh, the kinds of history that I do. I also tell them about my hobbies and the fact that there's nothing living in my house but a plant. Um, all these things are just there to close that gap. You also want to tell your students how to use their time. This is really important in our new situation. Our students are very often tethered to the idea of coming to class on a particular day at a particular time, and a lot of asynchronous work doesn't work that way. So this is a little visual guide that I made for my students last term that showed them one way that they could organize their time in a week to get everything done for my class. Now, I did not create this from the ground up. This was a template that I got elsewhere and I will tell you more about that in a second. Um, so please don't think I have incredible tech skills. This just uh, needed me to type things in. Um, but this was one sample schedule. And then I encouraged my students to use it to bounce ideas off and make their own. So the second thing that's important is if you are teaching in any uh, modality other than being in a brick and mortar environment for all your instruction, ditch the class schedule as far as you can. So what does this actually mean? Usually I teach on a very specific schedule. So for instance, I was scheduled to teach the history of gender and sexuality in the United States three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday during fourth period which is noon to 1, 10 p.m. So all of my teaching was anchored to those points. There was reading to do before class. There was homework to do after class. But now that I'm teaching mostly online, I don't have to hold to that class schedule anymore. So instead, I design modules 
And those modules can be of any length that you really want them to be. A week, 10 days, two weeks, three modules a semester, whatever works for you. So in that gender and sexuality class, I had a module about colonial America. I decided on the modules by setting goals for my students, deciding what I wanted them to master in terms of content and skills in any given module. And so in this module about colonial America, I really wanted them to master the art of textual analysis. All of this adds up to a great deal of flexibility. Like I said, modules can be any length that you want them to be. You're no longer constrained by that Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. My modules were all one week long last semester. So for this, this meant for me that most of my instruction was done asynchronously. I had synchronous discussions with my students once a week, and this preserved an awful lot of flexibility for myself and my students in terms of when we did the work we had to do. And I want to emphasize it really worked for me as well as working for my students. A quick word about asynchronous work. Um, this is a little diagram to give you some idea of why asynchronous work can be so important. You can see on the left where Knox is located. You can see where one of my colleagues spent the whole of fall semester. He was in Turkey with his ailing mother. You can see that one of my students was in South Korea on the other side of the world. And the rest of my students fell into almost every time zone between here and there. So allowing uh, there to be asynchronous work meant that I got to preserve flexibility for all of us and got the greatest amount of student participation. So this is a sample module. This is from week three of last fall. And you can see that uh, inside the module on my LMS, I have the tasks listed in the order that my students should do them. So they really don't have to do a lot of searching or thinking about what they do in what order. And that really helps with time management and organization. The third thing that's really important, the last little breath is building community. Now, usually if we're in a brick and mortar environment, we might use the first class period for introductions and icebreakers, but online and in hybrid and high flex environments, community building takes a lot longer. It's a lot slower process. So build it into the entirety of your first module and make sure you keep coming back to introductory activities to really build a sense of cohesion between yourself and your students. So here are some ways you could build community. The obvious thing is to have everyone introduce themselves, but you have multiple modalities in which this could happen. So you could have people post to the LMS, you could have them make short videos, you could have them make a Google slide, you could have them record little audio podcasts about themselves and then share them. And then encourage other people to go in, read or engage with those little introductions and respond to them so that the students start to get to know one another. Do check-ins at the beginning of any of your synchronous sessions. How's everyone doing? In this moment in time, that's a huge question and really important to ask. Um, again, you can do this with audio, you can do it in the chat box in Zoom, you can have them respond with emojis. It doesn't have to be a long process, but it should be a repeated process. Use breakout groups in things like Zoom. But make sure if you are using breakout groups that you're providing really clear instructions to students about what they should do in that group and that they get to create something to bring back to the large group again. What that does is help everybody with the jitters so that they're not sort of sitting there looking at each other wondering what to say. It also really helps students who have things like ADHD to get stay focused. All of these things are low stakes. Some other suggestions, you could have them solve a topic related crossword puzzle. There are lots of free crossword puzzle generators online. Have them do some kind of virtual treasure hunt. The opportunities and ideas are truly endless. Another way of making that group cohesion is to collaborate with students in their learning. So ask your students what they need from you very early in the semester and set some learning goals together. 
that is a way of getting students really invested in what they're about to learn, for them to consider what is it I'm here to do, and to think about it in a little bit more depth than simply, I needed this class for my major. So I asked my students what they needed last fall, and this was some of the things they told me. So they needed visual organizers about time management in particular. They wanted self-care resources because their mental health was really under siege in fall. So that's uh, there were multiple things under this tab. And then in the self-care inventory, that was one way of them deciding what self-care would work best for them. Um, I also made them a handout about how to read for my class because many of them were not history majors and really struggled. So, sorry, I went backwards there. This was a handout that I made about how to read for my class. Don't reinvent the wheel and try and do this from the ground up unless that brings you joy. You can go to canva.com or vengage.com and there are other sites as well, but these two are really good and they're free and you can use their templates to make really slick looking uh, presentations and handouts. And then setting the learning goals. This was the first piece of homework that my students had to do in my class, was to sit down and say to themselves, what do I really want to get out of this class by the end of term? It was super important for getting them invested. And we returned to these learning goals at the end of class to see how they did and how they felt the class had or hadn't met their needs. So those are little things that you can do at the beginning of the semester that will generate a lot of goodwill as you move through the term. Now to the big breaths. And the biggest breath of all is to do lots of formative assessment this next semester. So formative assessment means reducing the number of formal assignments or high stakes assignments with a grade attached that you give to your students in any given time period. So I went from five different assignments to three in the fall, all of them scaffolded in different ways. Formative assessment basically means it's ungraded. It's low stakes. There's very little anxiety attached to it. And it means that you can give students lots of feedback, but you're not in the position of evaluating what they're writing or producing in order to give them a grade for it, which makes it a lot easier on us. Lots of feedback means you're building great skills in your students. You're giving them the opportunity to practice the skills that you want them to be able to employ in those formal assignments. And what I saw was that it built to the formal assignments and they did better on them because their confidence was so much greater. I also had a different relationship with my students because I was in constant contact with them through these formative assignments. Now, you're probably thinking, but if I just sub out formative assignments for the assignments I would normally grade, how is that making my life any easier or creating any breathing room? So I wanna give you some concrete examples. This is the module that I referred to earlier, the third week of my term last fall, with the tasks listed in the order my students should do them. Here's the first piece of formative assessment that I did. I had my students do retrieval practice by thinking back on what they had learned the previous week. So here's what that looked like. It was a short Google form quiz where I asked them to remember three things from the previous week. They could be anything, large or small. The other question I asked was, is there anything else you want me to know? And this was crucial. It was a place where people told me they were confused or where they were struggling. But it was also a place where people told me they were having mental health difficulties or that COVID was in their apartment or that they were sick themselves. And it gave me the opportunity to reach out to them directly. So the first thing I did was retrieval practice. The next thing they did was a reading check-in. And this was really about accountability. This was a way of seeing if people had done the reading, but without telling them that it was so important and anxiety producing that they were getting a grade for it. And it worked like a dream. So again, it was a Google form. 
And I asked everybody to tell me how much of the reading they had done, not so that I could judge them, but so that I had a realistic sense when I walked into our synchronous discussion sections about what exactly we were gonna be able to do. I asked them what they learned from the readings, what they wanted to talk about, and what left them confused. And instead of giving them written comments individually, I would read these before class and then address their questions, comments, and concerns in the synchronous class session. Again, you see at the end, anything else you want to share. And this was a way of getting information from students to me so that I could reach out to them if they needed extra support. The last thing that we did was in this particular week, a group annotation project. Again, this was not graded, but it was a way of teaching them how to read critically so that they could do that to go forward to another assignment. So here's what that looked like. I did not use annotation software, although there are some incredible pieces of software out there. I was very cognizant of the fact that my students seemed a little overloaded with new tech. And so we had the reading here, the reading shall go with their mothers. And we had a Google Doc in which people use different colored fonts to indicate they were a different person. And they had a conversation with each other about what they read. It worked beautifully. It was low anxiety for them. It told me an enormous amount about what they were getting out of the readings and where I needed to give them help. But I was only responding to four or five of these because they were doing them in groups instead of responding to individual papers. The last thing I would suggest is to let it go. <laughs> and here's Elsa giving us a little tip to do that. Now, I want to talk briefly about trauma amongst ourselves and our students. But first, I want to say that you should take care of yourself. And if a discussion of trauma is something that could traumatize you, then please feel free to mute or to turn off your camera or to leave to take care of yourself. So a definition of trauma that comes from the federal government is that it includes one time, multiple or long lasting repetitive events. And you can see how that could be something like a terrible car crash, but it can also be living in a pandemic. Trauma is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and has lasting adverse effect on the individual's functioning. Now, I am no medical expert, although I do have PTSD myself and I'm familiar with some of the ways that trauma manifests. I just want to focus on one way that trauma can manifest in our students and in us. That's executive function problems. Trauma, uh, when trauma occurs, executive function is one of the first things to go. It leads to foggy thinking, to poor memory, to poor organizational problems, to the inability to analyze things, and it causes people to struggle with time management. So do you see your students in these descriptions if you think back to how they performed in fall? And do you see yourself and some of the things that you struggled with in fall. I know I struggled with absolutely every one of these. So what do you do faced with this problem? The answer is to be incredibly flexible. That means being flexible with your students and being flexible with yourself. It means being flexible with your attendance policies, with participation policies, and with due dates. Now, if you are someone who is singularly teaching 200 students in a lecture class alone, you've got a different problem than I had with 15 people in one of my classes. But these are all scalable things. And we can talk about that a little bit after the presentation and pool our ideas for how you can do this. But please remember that mental health days are important. They are important for you. They are important for our students. And in fact, I built into my class a week where my students had no reading to do, but just did some written reflections for me that were very informal, kept them engaged, but gave them room to breathe. So in being flexible, we need to think about what your learning goals are. Does every assignment need to be graded? Absolutely not. Like I said, use formative assessment wherever you can. 
Does every assignment need to be a written assignment? No, they can learn incredible things about history by producing other things, maps, quilts, food, the sky is the limit. And does every written assignment need line edits in response, which is one of the ways that I lose all my time? No, you can isolate the two big things that someone needs to work on to write a better paper and have a great conversation or set of comments with a student without going through and correcting everything on every line. Here's an example of an assignment that does not require my students to write. So this is an example of an un-essay. And an un-essay is where students do anything but write a paper. So you can see I gave them some suggestions. These are based on things my students have done in the past. Poetry, rap, make a map, make a zine. Um, people have made sculptures. People have done embroidery for me. My students had to propose their project to me to tell me so that I could see that it had merit. In that proposal, they told me how they thought it should be graded so that we could have a conversation about setting their goals for them. And then their project was submitted to me at the very end of my term. The most important thing for making sure that you have breathing room for your students and yourselves is to be kind. Always default to kindness. Now that doesn't mean that you will magically always have an impulse to be kind as the first thing that comes to mind. Certainly my students can uh, make me angry, they can make me very frustrated, but I always take the time to check that response and respond with kindness and give them the benefit of the doubt. Being kind means believing my students and it also means believing in them. They pay that back a thousandfold. So we're gonna move from me doing all the talking to figuring out what sort of questions, comments, and concerns you have and what adaptations you can think of for these ideas. And here is where you can contact me if you have any questions or want any follow-up. I'm CJ Denial on Twitter, which is where I spend a lot of time. I'm cdenial at knox.edu if you'd like to drop me an email and you can find my blog at katherinedenial.org. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Kate. Gosh, that's just super, super fantastic. And there have been so many great questions in the chat. Um, I thought we could start with um, a very practical one, which is lots of people saying, what was that website again where you, you, where you make graphics? Because it's really amazing. And I was, try I was doing too many things at once. Um, and so I didn't quite catch it. I will put that in the chat for everybody. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, that is great. Okay, and I just wanted to remind everyone too, I just put this in the chat, but that Kate is gonna be back at the OI, at the OI or at the virtual OI um, in January to talk about a pedagogy of kindness. And that's, I think gonna be super wonderful. Okay, so canva.com, there you go. There's those two, um, those two websites, fantastic. Okay, so um, there are a couple of people have asked about um, some of the some of the formatives and how students respond when work is not required. So what happens? So you said you had a lot of success with this, but other folks are feeling like, well, if it's not required, students are stretched. And um, so can you speak to that? What do you do when, um, how do you make it um, a value for them if it's not graded? How do you explain to them the value of doing things when they're not getting a grade back? <laughs> I think there's a couple things to bear in mind. The first is that just like we have to teach them to be successful in our classes, we have to teach them why we're making the pedagogical choices that we're making. And so I tell them what retrieval practice is, for example, on why that's gonna improve their memory and improve the number of things that they will take away from a class so that they can see the value of doing it even when there's no grade attached. And I would argue that having a grade attached doesn't always indicate value, right? It often indicates just a, a hoop that people have to jump through. Um, so I would tell them what the pedagogical choice is. And then also they could see that the things that they put into say the reading check-ins would show up in class. So they saw that I took them seriously, that I wove them into my teaching, that I changed my lesson plans in response to the things that they thought were most important. And so there was a sort of feedback loop 
that established itself where they just, again, saw the value in completing the task, even though there was no grade. Um, I had set my last paper of the term asked students to reflect on the class, on what they had learned. And several of those students said that not having those uh, check-ins and quizzes required meant that they felt better about doing them. They would do them even if they half-assed them. And half-assed is better than nothing, right? Um, and uh, they said that it took a lot of pressure off them. It reduced their anxiety and made them more willing to participate in the things we were doing in class. That, that's fantastic. Um, really fantastic. It, it's Sounds to me, my, my translation of this um, was a little bit um, like some of the work I do in neurodiversity, which was just making it utterly transparent. Like it sounds like so much of what you're doing is just making things transparent and explicit for your students. So they understand why you're doing something so that they see a quick payoff for what you're doing. And then they invest again. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so great, Kate. This is a wonderful, uh, there's a lot of gushing going on in the chat. Um, <laughs> so um, just along those lines though, do you, just to back to the question about what you require or not require, um, Celine had asked a question about whether you require students to, um, to visit those info sections and how it is that you um, uh, push them to do that. She said that she had something like what you would talked about it in your first slides, um, but that, that she just couldn't get the students to go there, even though she incentivized it as best she could. Um, only, I think she said five out of 30 or something students did. So how do you make sure they visit that stuff? Have you incentivized it explicitly? Or again, have you got another trick in your bag for that? Well, one of the ways that I incentivize them reading the things I put up is that we always explicitly discuss them, right? So for example, the syllabus. One of their first pieces of homework is uh, to annotate the syllabus. I did not come up with this idea and I'm gonna blank on the person whose name, uh, the name of the person who came up with this. But um, you basically don't give the syllabus out at the beginning of class and you don't go over it on the first class of the term. Instead, what you do is give it to them as homework, explain what annotation is, and then have them annotate that syllabus and bring it back to the next class. Then you can answer their questions and their comments. You can talk about what they found interesting about things. There's suddenly accountability there that there wasn't before. And so suddenly people actually read the syllabus, right? The same is true of doing things that are in your start here module, right? Um, is there some accountability built in? Are you gonna ask them questions about it? Are you gonna check in? Um, is there, uh, something fun you could do in class. Can you play Jeopardy, right? Can you do um, a little Quizlet where they're in teams and the idea is that they've got to retrieve information from that start here module. Lots of ways that you can do accountability without a grade and without forcing people, but just encourage the sense of um, this is useful information for you and we're gonna have a little bit of fun with it too. That's great. Um, so I had a, a first year college student at home with me this fall, um, taking a class at our local community college. And one of the things I noticed was he missed a few things at the very start. And then he didn't want to do them because he felt like he was already behind because there was a lot, there was a lot to do. And other folks have asked this question about whether you found that students were becoming overwhelmed with a lot to do or whether, um, somehow you could help keep them on track and on pace. What is What was your strategy for that? I think there are two things. I didn't get too hung up on people missing those ungraded formative assessments. Um, I had a couple of students who like in week seven went back and did them all. And I actually wrote them and said, you really don't need to do this work, it's okay. Um, but I, I didn't put a lot of uh, pressure on them in terms of completing them. But again, in seeing that I was using the information there, I could make them see the value in doing those things. The other thing is that because I gave people say on the reading check-ins, the option to say, I didn't do any reading this week and had that section that said, is there anything else you wanna tell me? I would know when my students were struggling and why they were struggling. And so I could reach out to them one by one. Even if they said, 
nothing in the, is there anything else you want to share section? If they told me they'd done very little of the reading, I could send them a very quick email and just say, hey, what's up? Do you need some extra support? Um, sometimes just that touch was enough to get them back on track. If they needed more help and more student services, I was able to intervene very soon. It didn't drag on for weeks. And then we got to a problem where they really weren't able to do the work in class because they had missed so much. So it was a great way of having early intervention. A question, a question from the chat about um, what kinds of things students are, um, this I guess we're, we're still hovering around the kind of intro section here, which sounds so important, but is that you sort of begin as you mean to go on here. But what sorts of things are students putting in the annotation to the syllabus? And are you kind of surprised by the things they, they add or did they seem expected to you? What can you tell us about that? Um, I tell them that annotation is just the um, business of taking notes, right? Of, of noting things of interest, of asking questions. And so sometimes they will have questions about um, clarifying why is my policy a certain way? I think that's 100% legitimate and they absolutely should get an answer to that. Um, I also get a lot of comments where people say, I've never seen this thing in a syllabus before. Why did you include it? Um, why do you stipulate X when my other teachers are stipulating Y? And so we have a lot of conversation about things that they like. I also ask them if there are things they don't like. Um, are there things they would change about the syllabus? Are there things that I didn't include that they think should be included? So it becomes a collaborative document that I can update with their feedback uh, rather than just something that is um, sort of a communication from an authority figure down, it becomes a two way street. It sounds like um, part of what you're saying is that you are trying to teach these students how to learn. Yes. Um, <laughs> you want them to do well in your course, but you really want them to succeed as learners yeah. um, in a kind of holistic way. Um, yeah. So there are some questions, I'm combining a couple of things here, but there have been some questions in the chat about how you balance a message of flexibility um, with students who uh, may have trouble activating uh, that is, you know, they, they, uh, some students seem to need more of a poke, although sometimes we're, it's hard for us to figure out what that, what that is. And then others who overwork, who seek out the extra thing. How, do you have some, a sense of balance there or do you kind of treat those, those issues as separate challenges? I think the way that I build my classes means that the students who are overachievers and who really want to extra engage have those opportunities built in, right? They can take longer with the readings. They can ask me more questions. They can tell me more things in their reading check-in and get an individualized response, right? Um, for the students who are not activating, um, again, I catch them very early because of those formative assessment tools. Um, I also don't um, have on my syllabus, for example, hey, you can turn things in whenever you want. Um, because I know from my life that that doesn't work for most people, right? Most of us are deadline oriented. And so I have deadlines for all of my assignments, but if anybody says, hey, I need a few more days, they get it. They don't have to tell me why. They don't have to give me some elaborate sort of uh, insight into their private life for me to give it. I simply give it. Um, in other places where uh, say an assignment comes in and I think that maybe I screwed up a little bit, didn't articulate something clearly, um, I'll give them all a week to rewrite it. Um, so then they see that I'm capable of making mistakes and giving them some grace to be able to sort of um, retweak and rectify that so we can work together. So I think all of these things sort of layer one on top of each other. The formative assessments are early identification tools. Having deadlines is really important. Allowing people those extra days without them having to disclose all kinds of private things to you, I think is also really important. Thank you. That was another key question people were asking about is, is too much flexibility um, kind of paralyzing for them? And I think- Yes. 
<laughs> I mean, it, it is, there's, there's a handful of people that I know in my entire professional life for whom that would not be paralyzing. I'm not one of them. Um, I was making the slides for this presentation yesterday uh, because I needed the absolute deadline to be there. Um, yeah. So I try and provide that for my students and then the flexibility is the follow-up. Yeah, yeah, lovely. My two favorite words, structure and expectations. So good. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, some questions about the, um, this distinctive time we find ourselves in and synchronous versus asynchronous teaching that some students seem to really like, again, the structure of synchronous meetings because they're finding um, whether it's security or just community um, others need the flexibility of asynchronous um, and yet are having a hard time with what feels to them like a little almost like extra work because when they're asynchronous do you have thoughts on synchronous versus asynchronous and again how we balance how we treat these two i'm going to answer the end of that before i answer the beginning of it um Again, I'm spacing on who said this, but someone made a very astute observation on Twitter and I'd be happy to send out a link to that actual tweet later, um, that we probably thought our students were doing a lot more of the work when we were all synchronous and face-to-face -face than they actually were. And so now, even though many of us have gone a little softer, perhaps taken out some readings to reduce the workload, our students feel like they're doing more because they're actually doing more of the work that we're assigning, right? So I think that's a really useful thing to bear in mind and to ask ourselves, you know, like, do we actually know that they were doing 100% of the work when we were meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Probably not, right? Um, the asynchronous and synchronous thing, I think is a, is a really um, tricky balance. I agree that some synchronous work is really important, especially for that sense of community. And almost none of the students that, well, certainly none of the students that I'm teaching are people who signed up for an online experience. They thought that they would be meeting synchronously in a physical classroom with a professor, right? So I have to teach them how to be online. I have to teach them how to do hybrid. Um, again, it goes back to transparency and setting expectations. They honestly don't know how to do it. And I sympathize and empathize with them because last March, when all of us were told you have to go online, I had no idea what I was doing at all. And so I get that sense of like, this is so different and it's not what I signed up for and I'm frustrated, right? So teaching them how to be online is important. Having a synchronous component is important for community building and for really uh, being able to reach out to people and work through things in real time. There's no replacement for that. But asynchronous is so important because our students are working, they're raising families, they're commuting, they're um, in a house with seven other people all trying to get online at once. So we need to make that flexibility available to them. And it actually works in our favor too, because when you're not tied to that class schedule, you can choose to do other things, other assessments, other ways of engaging with students. I really appreciate your point about um, how transparency is the key to that. Um, just expressing to them, you know, why you know why one does one thing and why one does does the other thing. Um, to go back to a question um, that you you already raised this issue about scalability. Yeah. Um, folks are asking about so how do, how does this work in you know a small student seminar or small um, class versus folks who have 100 or even 200 students, some with TAs, some without T TAs. Can you talk about how to think of scaling some of your um, insights and practices? I think the people who have it toughest are the people who are teaching something like a 200 person lecture class without any teaching assistance. Um, and so you're really, it's you and 200 people. And how do you make that personalized and intimate and meaningful, right? One of the ways that I would suggest um, scaling things is to put people in groups. And I don't mean in the sense of the dreaded group work. 
What I mean is that you create little cohorts for people so that they can do their introductions with a smaller group. They can do some of their work that's ungraded with another group. They can discuss things with that smaller group, right? So that instead of it being one of 200, they're one of 10 or one of five, right? And you are also engaging with those groups. So a colleague of mine who had a very intensive music class last fall, um, she put her students into these smaller groups and then met with the groups once a week. So she had um, more face-to-face -face contact time than I had with my students, but it also worked really well for her in that she wasn't trying to reach 200 people in one, at one time in one modality, right? Um, I think that where you have TAs, there you encourage them to practice these things that we've been talking about, right? I think that where your classes are smaller, um, that to me is the easiest. And I know for some people it's terrifying because suddenly it's so immediate. Um, but where I had 26 students in a class, we fitted on Zoom. Um, we had great conversations. We had a great balance between people talking in chat and talking in real time through Zoom. Um, so I would suggest right, the breaking it down into those smaller groups so that people have a sense of accountability to someone who is a name and a face and a known quantity. Thank you for that. A, a, a related question here is about um, what you think about using Zoom breakouts um, and, um, and what you think about using discussion boards um, and how one monitors all of those things going on. Right. And I guess just to add <laughs> another layer to that question is um, the monitoring of that to make sure that it stays positive and productive kind of across all those different spaces. And if you have thoughts about that too. So um, the first thing I would say is with your students, make community standards for how you're going to have conversations. That's especially important for the kinds of history that we're teaching. Um, it's all about race and gender and sexuality, right? It's all about these things. And so there are going to be difficult conversations. So I have a set of ground rules that I bring in and offer to my students. They then discuss them and then they come back and say, okay, we like these, we don't like these, we wanna add something, we wanna take something away. And until we built consensus, we don't enshrine those ground rules. Obviously, in a classroom full of 200 people, you would have to do that in a slightly different way. Um, perhaps you could put it on a Google form and then have people respond to you and tell you where they think it's working and not, and then pull all of those things together. Um, but I think having those community standards is so, so important. Um, I have friends who just don't even bring in the ground rules. They just start from scratch and say, what do you think we need to have some rules for the way we interact? Um, I find that that takes a long time to do, which is why I bring in ground rules to start us off. But the other argument to that is that maybe I'm shutting down some great ideas because I'm giving them something in too much of a structured form. So I can see that in either way. Um, breakout rooms are great given a couple of caveats. So uh, something I learned really recently from Karen Costa is that if you have ADHD or some other kind of um, attention problem or um, you know, it, it's your executive function problem, then the switch from being in a large group Zoom to being in a small breakout room is like a hard return. It is something that completely resets your concentration. You have to refocus and come in again. And so that can be really disruptive to somebody with ADHD. So making sure you've got really clear guidelines for what is gonna happen in that breakout room available as a shared document to all of your students is crucial. Making sure you have a defined goal for what they are going to do in there is really important. And don't throw people into breakout groups until they've had a chance to get to know one another a little bit. Um, so famously, I saw somebody uh, observe on Twitter recently that they were at a virtual conference. And when the virtual conference went into breakout rooms, everyone left. 
all the faculty just hightailed it because people didn't know each other, right? And so they were like, I don't want to discuss this intimate thing with these people that I don't know. Um, so that was very telling for how our students feel at the beginning of the semester, right? These are complete strangers. So how, why should they trust them? That's another reason that building community is so, so important as something that we do right at the very beginning. Um, there was another piece of that, discussion boards. I don't use discussion boards because I haven't personally found a good way to do it. And that I think I am willing to be taught. If there's someone who's figured this out, I am all ears. Um, but for me, it becomes a little bit too much of a checking the box environment where people are saying things like, you know, you must have two responses to somebody else's things and one original response yourself. And it feels very inauthentic to me. Um, so I'm looking for ways for that to become a more authentic experience. And I, like I said, I'm all ears for ways that that could happen. Thank you. That's great. Um, just so helpful, Kate. Um, a question about boundaries um, with students. You know, you've talked about a really generous mode of interaction with your students, some transparency um, about your own circumstance, how you're situated in the moment. Um, but how do you manage boundaries with your students? And you, and you ask them to be frank about their own situation. How do you think about boundaries as an issue? Is it not an issue? Like, how, do, how would you respond to that? I don't have an issue with people transgressing boundaries. Um, I'm very clear about certain things. So <clears throat> in my syllabus, I say, for example, that I will generally be on email from nine to nine. If they write me after nine o'clock at night, I'm not gonna get them a reply until the next day, right? I am very clear that uh, if, they, if there is something in an assignment that it, it should be followed, right? Um, I'm very clear about taking the weekends off from being responsive. Um, my students really respect that. And actually I encourage them to see that as a model they should follow, that they should take some time off completely from their academic work at some point in the week. Um, I think that people, uh, what we are not is counselors. We are not therapists. It is not our job to save students, um, even if that were something it's possible for anyone to do. Um, so knowing where I can and cannot go is a great guide for myself. So uh, I know when I need to refer them to counseling services, I know what the other student services are on my campus. I know when they may need um, financial help for example, um, on where to direct them for that. Where can they get testing for disabilities? Um, all of the other services on my campus are there to be used. And I'm only gonna break myself if I try and take on all the work of all those other people who are very specialized and much better trained in this stuff than me, right? So I think it's having a clear sense of boundaries for yourself that then makes it able, you able to communicate them to your students. Yeah, um, I think that's a, a, another really, I know I just keep saying the same thing, Kate. Gosh, that's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking about our colleagues who um, may be teaching um, in contingent positions, who may be um, you know, having to teach in multiple institutions and having to learn you know, those kinds of things from multiple institutions. It's also making me rethink what maybe as, um, as teachers, we should be asking for the info sessions that we get when we're introduced to an institution. These are the things I need to know so that I know them for my students, essentially. And if, uh, if people here are chairs of departments, that's the kind of information that your faculty need. Yeah, how do you find this place to refer your students to that thing, mm -hmm. right? Okay, yep. that's great, that's great. Um, a couple of, uh, let's see, we've got a, just a couple more minutes, but I wanted to ask you a, about some of your, um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> if that were my house, there would be a parking dog. Um, <laughs> oh no, actually, sorry, just sadness. I'm remembering my dog just went deaf this summer. So actually he's not barking anymore. I know, moment of generous kindness. Mm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so one last question about your unessay and your variety of assignments. Folks are wondering 
um, if you could talk a little bit about how you set up your expectations for those assignments that may look, um, I think some of us have read about on essays, but we may not be familiar with how you create um, the expectations for what seems like a, a, a super flexible assignment. Right. So um, I tell my students that their job is to show me what they have learned through any medium that they have. Um, so that means that they can um, do a range of things, right? I ask them to make connections to other classes that they have. Um, sometimes, you know, I've got like biology majors in my class. So how can we really um, use the information and the things you're doing in other places um, to be able to bring it into my class? Um, how do you make connections between disciplines, that kind of thing? But the, go the goal is show me what you have learned in any medium that you choose and tell me how you think it should be graded. So in my class, we have a set of grading standards that again, we agree to on a consensus basis. I bring in the basic document and then we edit it and change it according to the class dynamic. Um, I tell them they can take that document and they can change it. They can make it uh, into something that's very specific to their particular project. They then turn that in when they turn in their project proposal. So I have an opportunity to look at it and go, that works or that doesn't work. Or here's where I think we need another part of thinking about grading. So um, when that's done, what I essentially have is a series of individualized grading standards for everything they turn in. So as they turn in their final project, their wrap, their embroidery, their food, whatever it is, then I can look at those grading standards and go, this is how we're gonna grade this. And this is how we will grade this other person's. Um, they also turn in a very short paper that explains what they learned from the process of doing the assignment. And that's where they also put their sources and a little bibliography, um, but it's very, very short, just two to three pages. It's just a, another document that just gives me a sense of what were you thinking as this was happening? Um, but the students run with it and make the most incredible things. And what's so liberating about unessays is you see what they know that they weren't able to tell you in words. And that's just an incredible thing to share with them. We've got lots of folks um, asking for some examples, Kate. And I think maybe we'll, um, we know that you're coming back to the OI in January about it, talking about a pedagogy of kindness. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll save some of these questions and ask you again, but folks are asking too for just examples um, of the grading standards document and some things like this. I think some of those things are on your blog as well and folks can look to your blog. Yes, so what I'm doing right now is putting into um, the chat my Twitter handle um, and my email address. If people want to get hold of me, I will be happy to share all my assignment sheets, my syllabus, my documents. Um, and on Twitter, I will put together a thread later this afternoon that brings some of these things together so that you've got a handy one-stop shop to be able to look at all this stuff. Thank you so much, Kate. We will, um, we will caption this and it will be on the OI events archive site. Um, and I'm just sharing a comment here. Kate, you are literally an inspiration. One of my oh. favorite historian superstars. Departments. <laughs> Um, so lovely, lovely, lovely. Anyway, so grateful, Kate. Thank you so much. Could everyone join me in a little reaction here? A little reaction applause for Kate. Yay! Thank you. I'm, I'm sending up. I like this little, I like this one too. <laughs> a little spray of joy there. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so really much. Wonderful. It was so great to be here. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon all. Bye-bye.